book uh, about the collectors because that's the first in a two book series, right? You've got mm -hmm. another book coming out in the reasonably near future. Yes, so volume two of the collectors, it's going to be called A Storm of Wishes. It comes out in October 2019. So um, tell and us, that is, um, go ahead. I was going to say, and that is um, already written and now we're in the copy editing stages. So it's basically done. Gotcha. So you, you'll have to go through it again and make sure that there's nothing horrendous left over after the copy edit, but otherwise you're good to go? Yes, almost there. <laughs> that has to be enormously satisfying. Ah, yeah. One last thing. <laughs> yes. Well, and I find writing sequels so hard. To me, book two of anything is just, it is the most difficult kind of writing to do. So I'm always extra relieved when book two is wrapped up. <laughs> well, jumping uh a little bit to the books of elsewhere because that's a, a five book series and i know that mm -hmm. we're all hoping that we, maybe one day we'll get a sixth book or maybe a spinoff uh something more within that universe can, can we get that exclusive here is that going to happen <laughs> i have no plans at this point to write any more of the books of elsewhere i'm sorry but i don't say never i mean maybe someday who knows but oh uh, no this interview is over i've asked the question i came here to ask have a nice day <laughs> Well, let's, let's talk about the collectors. Remind uh, Steam Reader, what what is the premise of the collectors? So the collectors, yes, is about a small boy named Van. Um, his actual name is Giovanni, but nobody calls him that except for his mother, who is a famous opera singer. So Van gets hauled all around the world with her to wherever she's currently performing, and they live in each city for just a couple of months at a time. So his life has been very rootless. Um, and Van is also hard of hearing. He wears hearing aids while his mother's whole life revolves around music. So they often exist in kind of different spheres. Um, and Van's main hobby is collecting weird little objects that he finds on the ground, things that other people have lost or dropped or wouldn't have noticed in the first place. But to him, they're like treasures. Um, so he has this box full of little lost and found objects um, that he keeps under his bed and then he creates little scenarios with them where he gets to act things out. It's kind of his imaginary world full of characters that he controls. Um, and one day when he's doing his collecting thing in a busy city park, he sees something that he's not supposed to be able to see, something literally no one else around him perceives, but Van sees it. And someone else notices that he noticed it. And that's how he gets pulled into this whole new world of magic and danger involving the collectors. And if you want to know what it is that Van sees, it sounds like you have to buy the book, but it's available <laughs> widely now. <laughs> yes, I don't want to give everything away, but like I told you, it does involve wishes and wish magic and a talking squirrel. I'll give you that hint as well. <laughs> oh, well, now I'm sold. Uh, before, <laughs> I was mostly leaning over the fence, but talking yeah. squirrel, that knocks me over the edge. Let's see what you got. <laughs> <laughs> and let me uh, ask you, when you're doing uh, research for your characters and trying mm -hmm. to put yourself uh, in their head for a, uh, a character who is hard of hearing, Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of research do you do to prepare for that? How do you put yourself in Van's head? I'm glad you asked that, um, because this was something that I didn't actually set out to do. I didn't know when I started writing the book that Van was going to be hard of hearing. Um, it was just something that the character himself sort of revealed to me when I was halfway through writing my first draft. And when I realized this about him, everything else in the story fell into place his mother's work, his hobbies, why he saw the world the way that he did. Everything suddenly made sense. It was like the magic key. And my, immediately, my immediate response was just to like chicken out, to just think, I, <laughs> I can't do that. I, I myself am not hard of hearing. I don't have anyone in my immediate family who is deaf or hard of hearing. And I wasn't sure that I could do justice to that kind of really you know, immersive experience. But I also couldn't take it out. Like once the character had told me this about himself, I couldn't remove it. It was like a real person had told me something about themselves and, and the story would not have worked without it. So instead I dove into research um, and I contacted the deaf and hard of hearing teachers at multiple local schools who were incredibly generous with me. They let me come and hang out and visit with their students who were also amazingly generous and fun and funny and imaginative. I mean, they told me all kinds of things that are woven into um, Van's, Van's story. And they let me follow them around to classes. And um, I also got to go and talk with a book club uh, from the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf, which is not too far from my home. And they had all read the first volume, actually, I think the first three volumes of the books of Elsewhere. And so we had this book club where they were all communicating in sign language and then their translator would help me out. And 
it was just amazing. And so I got to ask them as well for, for insight into what Van's experiences of this magical world would be like. Um, so yeah, with all of that help and all of that research, I finally felt like I'm, I'm still not sure I'm doing it complete justice, but I felt like I had done my best to, yeah, to have all the right, the right facts, the right perspectives woven into the character. Well, is there any, any aspect of any book where you've ever just sat back and said, nailed it. I've, <laughs> I've done everything 100% perfect. There's no reason to feel insecure whatsoever. No, never. That'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, for uh, authors that might want to do something similar, um, how did you go about approaching these folks to, to let you do the research? Um, well, the, the nice thing is I come from an education background, so I knew people in various um, school districts near me. So I could say to one teacher friend or a relative, hey, who's the person at the school who I should contact about this? And then teachers tend to be delightful people. <laughs> so if you reach out to them, their usual response is, sure, you know, come and chat with us or I'll make time for you. They're just, I mean, on top of everything else that they're doing, they're really wonderful, helpful people. Um, and one of them has even read my entire manuscript and made sure I had nothing, you know, left in it that was too egregious before I sent it off to my editor. So, yeah, just reaching out either through email or through a phone call has been, I mean, I've never had anybody say, nope, not interested. In my experience, whenever you tell someone, I'm writing a story and I'd really love your expertise to help me out, because everybody loves to help tell a story. I mean, and then they know they get thanked in the acknowledgments and they're woven into that character and... Yeah, it's, it's all just been really, really welcoming and helpful. So be brave and ask is my advice. <laughs> well, it makes 100% of sense. I, I found um, just over a lifetime, one of the easiest ways to get insight into a character or anything else is just sit down or hop on the phone with somebody, but sit down across from somebody, look them in the eye and say, tell me things about you. And very few people can resist that opportunity because oh, yeah. we're all walking around wishing to tell people <laughs> things about ourselves. And so if somebody's honestly going to listen if I were a psychologist, um, what a what a terrible lapse in ethics. Uh, I'd want to write down everything somebody told me. Like, oh, my gosh, your marriage is so terrible. That's exactly what my novel needs. Exactly. Uh, oh, this is so juicy. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just change this guy's character from uh, Tad to Chad. Boom. There you go. Protected no one will notice. No problem. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about uh, the books of Elsewhere in conjunction with the collectors, because how do you know uh, when you're starting a story, whether you've got uh, a standalone on your hand, a series on your hand, a, a two novel series or a five novel series? When does that information hit? Um, to be honest, I never do know. It's with my with the books of Elsewhere. That was my very first project, my very first book. I mean, when I got my agent um, and the book I had sent to him was what became The Shadows, the first of the books of Elsewhere. I had not even let myself think about a sequel because I was so sure that no one would want one book from me. Of course, they wouldn't want a second. <laughs> um, and then he, you know, read the story and got to the end and said, well, you're planning on writing a sequel, right? And I said, sure, because <laughs> now someone wanted me to. I had just like <laughs> literally never let my imagination open that door. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, the story, I did not really have to restructure once I started, you know, writing that second book because I had left all of these doors closed but not locked. Like, there were all kinds of things that I had not fully resolved in that first book. It was like I had been subconsciously writing the start of the series, but yeah, completely subconsciously. Um, so then when my editor for that project and I started to talk about it, um, Jess Garrison at Dial, she is wonderful. Um, she said, well, what do you think about the idea of making it a series and having this much bigger canvas to plan? And once again, I said, sure, because now I had someone who wanted multiple books from me. I would actually be employed for years <laughs> and I would get to, you know, expand the story in all kinds of exciting ways. Um, so in that discussion, we kind of settled on how about five books? And if that were happening to me today, I know I'm pretty much positive. I would not have had the confidence or the hubris to be like, sure, I can write a book a year. Um, but I just, I dove in and um, to my good fortune, everything did work out. I had plenty more to explore with those characters in that world. And, um, and I think knowing, so it was right around the beginning of book two that I knew I was going to have five books. 
So knowing the size of the canvas that I was going to get to fill really helped me. If I had, had you know, learned halfway through the series, oh, wait, nope, it's going to be six books, I would have been in real trouble. But <laughs> when I knew the exact size of my parameters, I could aim for this very specific endpoint. I knew how it was all going to wrap up. And then with each volume that came in between, I kind of had a story that could stand on its own, but that is also adding to that final, you know, culmination of everything. So it's like a series of stairs getting to the last big jump. Um, so yeah, that's how that one worked for me. Like I said, I think I got really lucky. I <laughs> now can't believe I just jumped in that way, but it, it worked. Um, with the collectors, I always knew it was going to be more than one book. I just wanted to, once again, have the space to explore a little bit more of this magical world. But I wasn't sure whether it was going to be two or three books. And when I sold it um, to my, my publisher for that book, she was also incredibly understanding and flexible. And so when I was kind of wavering between two and three and, and told her, I'm really not sure, I kind of am leaning toward two, she let me put off that decision for a while until book two was underway. And then it was like feeling pretty clear to me that, yeah, this was all the story was gonna take. So that is going to be a two book series, which feels very comfortable to me. And then for my third book, I get to write something else, a standalone for her. So that's what's next in my future. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> what uh, wonderful flexibility you have, uh, it sounds like, at this point in your career. Yeah, I've, I've gotten lucky. Although this is the first time that I have felt this kind of flexibility. I mean, the books of Elsewhere were a, a pretty tight schedule of a book a year for those five years. And then, yeah, once this was underway, I, again, had my parameters of one book, book two, um, and you don't want to keep your readers waiting for too long, so there is pressure to get everything done on time. But yeah, at this point, now I kind of have all the room in the world to explore and decide what I want to pursue next, which feels crazy. <laughs> oh, it's a good feeling for a while until it's been too long, and I'm on my second binge Netflix series, and I go, oh, what am I doing with my life? I need to, I need to write something new. Exactly. 